Ko ulua kalana paua pelema Hawaii loa. I come from Hawaii, a place where we can still recall the voyages of our first people, who navigated thousands of miles across the ocean to find the most isolated islands in the world. Hanau ko uku ko a ko a hanau kana hea ko a ko a puka. I come from a place where our oceans are so highly revered that our creation story tells us that the coral polyp was the first organism created. He puko akani aina. I come from a place where we are taught that our coral reefs grow into islands, and the health of our islands is intimately connected to the health of our reefs. He Hawaii ao. I come from Hawaii, therefore I am Hawaii. I come from a place where our love for our home is so great that Kanaka, people, and Aina, land, cannot be separated. I come from a place where the science tells us that our oldest and most sacred islands, Papahanao Mokuakea, will be uninhabitable in the next 30 years and removed by sea level rise in the next 80 years. I am an islander from Hawaii who relies upon ancestral knowledge and modern technology to identify the best solutions so that we, as a collective island people, can adapt and survive climate change. But, like most people from my generation, I didn't grow up knowing these stories. My journey for me began on a voyaging canoe, sailing and navigating in the ways of my ancestors. My teachers were my aunties and my uncles. They taught us how to learn on a canoe, using the canoe as a classroom, the ocean as a map, the sky as a blackboard, and deep sea voyages were a final exam. To give you a better idea of what it was like to learn by doing, I wanted to share with you a journal entry from my first deep sea voyage along Kealikahiki. Kealikahiki is the pathway from Hawaii to Tahiti, Kahiki, or some of you may know as French Polynesia. This 2,500 mile journey is something that we navigated without using GPS or sextants. June 16, 2014, day 15, Hawaii to Tahiti. Have you ever tried to look for something? Something you have no idea what it looks like? Sometimes it's even harder when someone tries to explain it from their perspective. Nainoa said the island will look like a faint irritation of the eye, like a fuzzy, uneven surface on the horizon, a wave that doesn't move. Look for the island as you reach the tops of the swells, not when you're at the trough. Don't stare too long or you will lose focus. I had no idea what he was talking about. <laughs> I never knew how tiring the search would be. We started searching the sunset before, looking for the glow of the island. We were blessed with a large moon, so when we saw a pile of birds before darkness, we continued our journey south. By sunrise, the hunt was intensified. Jason and I spent all morning looking to see if the birds would show us their path home. No such luck. They were all fishing by early morning, which must mean the island is still fairly far away. Frustration set in by midday, standing on the railings, holding tight to the shrouds, bending my knees and absorbing the lift of the canoe as the swells passed underneath. I could only stand for 20 minutes at a time. My eyes would get weary and my mind would start to wander. It's mid-afternoon now. The southeast swell we saw yesterday is entirely gone. We're getting close. Only a chain of islands could block a large swell like that. On the horizon, we begin to see patches of haze. But is that just my mind playing tricks on me? Our goal right now is speed, cover as many miles as we can before we lose the light. As sunset approaches, Nainoa calls another meeting. With no sight of land, he tells us to spread out along the railings and look for the Manuoku. We're looking for the little white birds that are flying home. At 5 p.m., Jenna spots land. We see clumps of trees in the horizon. The island looks just as Nainoa described, a faint irritation of the eye, like a fuzzy, uneven surface on the horizon, a wave that doesn't move. We spotted the islands, the tips of the coconut trees. It was this experience that inspired me to be a teacher and a scientist. My teachers, they created spaces for us to be confident in the decisions that we made 
and the teachings of our ancestors. They created spaces for us to grow, to succeed, and they were there for us when we felt like we had failed. It was these experiences that inspired me personally to want to shift the narrative of how islands and island people are portrayed in the sciences. As I grew up in the sciences, I dreamt of one day creating similar learning experiences for other youth. And that dream came true this past summer. With the support of research grants, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Namako Onana, friends and family, we were able to embark on a voyage of a lifetime. This trip was unique in many ways. The first being that we decided to sail on a triple-masted steel hull sailing vessel named Makani Olu rather than your typical research vessel. This required that all of our crew and our students learn how to sail. They had to hold watch, and together as a collective, we had to work extremely hard to get to our study site and back. Secondly, our trip was to Papahānaumokuākea. Papahānaumokuākea is an aina kupuna. It's a sacred space. Papahānaumokuākea is also a cultural and natural world heritage site. It's a marine national monument, and it's up for designation as a marine national sanctuary. All of these accolades make it extremely difficult to get access and to conduct research in this space. Our crew required a research permit, a cultural permit, a manager's permit, and a conservation permit. The original goal of our trip was to assess the impacts of Hurricane Malacca, a Category 3 hurricane that occurred in 2018, with maximum sustained winds of 125 miles per hour, large swaths of pristine reef were converted to rubble, and an entire island was removed from the sea. This island was home to 90% of the critically threatened Hawaiian green sea turtle and the endangered Hawaiian monk seal. But as we continued to plan for this voyage, and COVID happened, and the trip got delayed multiple times, we realized that this trip would be about so much more than just research. And we decided to go with an all-Hawaiian research crew. Why Hawaiian, you may ask? Why not? <laughs> but for real. Um, <laughs> so how we are represented as Native people is sacred. Oftentimes in the sciences, the lack of representation or the failure of representation is the status quo. According to the National Science Foundation's 2019 survey of doctorate recipients, of the 26,250 PhDs that have been awarded in the ocean sciences, geosciences, and atmospheric sciences, less than 0.09% have been awarded to Alaska Natives, or American Indians. Less than 1.5% have been awarded to other race. Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and all those who check more than one race other than Hispanic or Latino are considered other race. Myself as a Native Hawaiian woman with a PhD in Earth Sciences is classified as other race. Our people have long been experts in the ocean, the earth, and the sky, and really nurtured relationships with these elements. Yet the colonial academic system fails to acknowledge our ancestral relationships, and instead fosters an environment where it's increasingly difficult and uncomfortable for us as Native people to receive the highest forms of Western recognition, a PhD. So our voyage, our huaka'i, our research expedition, was about more than just research. It was about pushing the boundaries of what representation in Native science looks like. So over the course of 15 days, our group of nine Native Hawaiian researchers and community members embarked on a voyage. We visited seven islands, we sailed more than a thousand nautical miles, and we conducted high quality research. We conducted RTK GPS surveys, intertidal surveys, and coral reef surveys. But most importantly, every island that we visited, we treated as a kupuna, or an elder. We offered prayer, we offered song, and my most memorable moment from this entire trip was standing on the deck of our sailboat, looking out towards one of the islands, Mokumanamana, 
and seeing my students, one by one, offer vai, offer water from their homes, and offer song. From Kauai, from Kailua, from Waianae, and from Mokuokeave. In that moment, my eyes got teary, I got a little emotional, but it was because I could feel the presence of my ancestors. And they were proud, because despite the statistics, we were starting to shift the face of what Native science looks like. So to give you guys a better idea of the impact that this trip had on my students, I wanted to share just a few journal entries. Um, the first is from Kainalu, and he asks, what does it mean to be resilient in times of huliao, or change? Although I have dabbled in and out of a handful of science courses and have had amazing research internship experiences, I've never really felt like a scientist, but rather a minority that struggles to carry out the work. But it is because so many supportive mentors and peers over the years that I'm grateful to have, to have had that have pushed me to lu'i kahana and be steadfast in exploring the field of science. Adding to that list, I'm humbled to be working alongside Haunani. This past year, she has really shown and reminded me that we are products of resilient kupuna, who continue to guide and inspire this collective work. The second, um, the second reflection that I wanted to share is from Lauren. She's a master's student who's studying with the community to better understand how climate change is impacting intertidal fisheries. Standing on the deck of Makani Olu with Lauren after full days of work, we finally got a moment to just take it all in. Lauren shared, it's easy to get caught up in thought, in the magic, the awe of the Kupuna Islands, and I knew exactly what she meant. These islands, although they are old and small and by some standards may appear frail or weak, these islands continue to give so much life. They provide safety for the unborn, a home to raise the young, and when storms come through, they take the brunt of the worst impact. They break so that everything else has a chance to survive. They build themselves back up because they are the strength that so many others rely on. Lauren continued, but like all living, breathing things, their time with us is not forever. The Kapuna Islands will continue to evolve, and in 100,000, 10,000 years, they may reappear as a reef that continues to feed, protect, and nourish. As I close, I want you to just think about those words of my students and the words of the students that you have heard tonight. We come from resilient people. We have a long history of adapting to change. <laughs> 